introduce Tim Bray. We're super excited to have him come down here from Vancouver to speak. Let's give him a big Web Visions welcome. That's, uh, that's Vancouver, Canada, by the way, not, not across the river <laughs> there. So uh, thanks for coming out. We're the last event of the day. I guess I'm standing between you and beer or the, and the, or the basketball game, whichever you care about most. Um, so you've been at sessions all day, which means uh, you've seen uh, a lot of slides. And I'm sure those slides were excellent, but, and you are full of eagerness to see more slides, but I'm not going to show you any. Um, I'm just going to bring up some web pages in the browser as I go along, because after all, it's a web talk for web lovers, so it should use web technology. So let's do that. Um, help me out a little bit. Who, who, who are you people? Uh, let me do a little, can we do some sorting into baskets here? Um, let's try three, these three baskets, uh, software developers, designers, and management. Okay, could we do that? So, no, no, I, I just gave you the options first. Hold on a second. Software, <laughs> software developers, designers, and management. Okay, software developers. A scattering. Designers, uh, a majority, I would say. Management, about the same as developers. OK, OK, fair enough. Um, I, I kind of fall into the developer basket myself, but I, I have been known to indulge in design over the years. Um, for the, uh, OK, fair enough. Perhaps I will cut back on the code samples. That would probably sound like it would be a good idea. So I'm probably going to run a solid 45 minutes and not have time for questions at the end. On the other hand, I'm going to be here tomorrow morning, so if you want to talk to me, I'll be around. And uh, you guys, I think, as you go out in the pub crawl, I'd like to join a little later. So you have a social responsibility when you get into a particularly good pub to tweet with a hashtag on it so I can search Twitter for Web Visions and find out where I can go get a beer and some company. Deal? Fair enough. OK, so this conference is called Web Visions. And this talk is about loving the web, which I do. And so do you, because I went to some of the sessions today. And you know the, the ambient affection for what it is we do to build the web was thick in the air. And I felt really at home there. So, so, so that's great. Having said that, this is kind of a dark-toned talk I'm going to be giving. Um, and mostly, I'm going to be worrying out loud about things that endanger the web as we've known it, and whether those things are problems, and if they are problems, what we can do about them. So I'll try and be upbeat, but you know, I, I actually do worry a lot these days. Um, and, and I've got to say that in, in worrying out loud about the web, I'm following in a sacred web tradition. Back in 1997, Wired magazine said, kiss your browser goodbye. The web is dead. And you know, the web's been being dead on a regular basis ever since 1997. So, so even if you know, the things I say really worry you, bear in mind that you know, predicting the web's death is part of the web culture anyhow. So don't worry about it too much. Uh, before I get into it, uh, f final procedural note, um, I'm probably going to not have time for questions at the end. But you know, if I'm saying something that seems like really starkly crazy and wrong to you, Wave your hand, and I, and I might ask you to, 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 to hold forth on that. Because I find you know, these things go better when we end up arguing about what you actually care about as opposed to what I think you should care about. Um, fair enough. So I'm not going to drone on about the death of the browser for as long as I'm standing here. Because what's wrong, with browser, what's wrong with the browser ecosystem is not that subtle or hard to understand or actually even controversial. And as developers, yeah, it, it is kind of sad. But, um, also, you know, it, it's a bad idea in a keynote to be too gloomy. Um, but I thought I'd start with a celebration of the good things. And um, I noticed a relatively few, small number of hands when I went up, uh, went up when I said developer. Are there, are there any p primarily server-side developers here in the room? OK, very few. But those hands who just went up, they are the hands of the happy people. <laughs> we are in the golden age of the server-side of web development. and. I, and I really believe that. I've been doing both client and server-side work for three decades. And, and right now, in 2014, it's never been better. Things are really pretty great. And a lot of you people are probably too young to remember how bad it used to be. But our profession spent a solid you know, decade and a half in what I call the Java nuclear winter, you know, when uh, <laughs> When anything that was implemented had to be implemented in Java, and it had to be stored in SQL, which probably meant writing a great big check to Larry Ellison before you could uh, actually d deliver any software. And being a server-side person sort of generally sucked back there. Who is that guy, anyhow? I mean, is, is he a hip downtown guy, or is he a street person? What is that? 
What is that? What is that computer he's got? Anyhow, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm wondering what it must be like in the Oracle product meetings when they pick the stock photography for the Java page. I, um, are the people in, in stock photography stock people? I've often wondered about that. Is there, you know, do they, they have them in buildings somewhere? Stock people? They go. They go. Um, anyhow, but you know, things are really a lot better these days. You know, if you're going to build something on the server, um, we've got a lot of choices. Um, you know, there's PHP, which a lot of stuff is built on in, and a lot of people like to sneer at PHP. Well, I do anyhow. And, but, you know, even, even though I sneer at it, let's bear in mind that a large part of Facebook and WordPress and, and Wikipedia are built in PHP, so empirically we see it can be used to do great things. And it's, you know, uh, a lot more agile and quicker than getting stuff done in Java. The effect of what I'm saying, all these things I'm about to say, from the point of view of the people in the room who are mostly on the client side, is that you can feel free to ask more you know, of the, your server-side people. The tools they are getting are getting better every year, and they should be able to do more for you every year. Now, PHP's been around for a long time. But you know, in the last few years, there's a lot of new stuff's come along and become mainstream. There, there's Rails. You know, a huge amount of stuff is on Rails these days, and they, they really need a better slogan than web development that doesn't hurt. I mean, you know, I think we kind of got past that OK. And of course, Django is, 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 is widely deployed, and especially Node these days. Um, is, is a big deal. I have to say um, that I'm not sure in my lengthy experience I've ever seen anything come out of the blocks and you know, get there right in the middle of the ecosystem in a big way, as Node has. And um, I'm not sure what lesson to take away from that. But boy, it's, it's, you know, you'll never, you're not going to get in trouble for using Node or Rails or Django. Um, used to be you get fired for that stuff, using anything but Java. So, so life is better. And what's great is that there's this huge bubbling software ferment on the server side with all sorts of wonderful, cool new stuff coming along. Um, oops. And, um, uh, okay, it gets smaller. Right. And um, the, the, on, it, it's, not, it's not hard to understand why things are so much better on the client side, or on the server side, than they are on the client side. On the server side, you know, when you're writing software, you really only have three interfaces to worry about. You have to talk to the operating system, which is represented by the penguin. You have to actually talk to the web stream, you know, requests coming in, HTML and graphics and multimedia going out. And you've got to talk to some sort of persistence engine. And that's really your whole world, which means that the vast majority of the code you write on the server side is actual application code that deals with application stuff and does application thinking and delivers business value directly. If, on the other hand, you're writing code on the client, and on this, in this case, I, when I say client, I mean both web, both browser, and mobile apps, because obviously mobile is a big deal, you know, it, the world is, is really a lot more complicated. Inside your typical mobile device, you still have the operating system, the web traffic, and you know, some sort of performance persistence layer, but you've got a microphone and some speakers, and you have telephony, and you've got a compass, and um, a camera, and a GPS, and you know, three different kinds of radios you got to talk to, and, and of course, a vibrator. Uh, and all of these things have, wait a second, you're laughing. You think I didn't mean it? See, there's the vibrator API, <laughs> right, right there, right there in, in Java. Um, and, and, and as a result, the kind of code that you write on the client tends to be these breathless little snatches of code. You know, get an event from the user and do one or two little things and then go make some complicated API calls into you know, the DOM or jQuery or Android or iOS or something like that. And um, it, it, it's, it, it's hard stuff to do. And one of the side effects is that on the server side, where you have mostly application code talking um, mostly application stuff, and mostly just accepting terms, uh, streams of text and emitting streams of data, um, you know, it's really easy to test. Server-side code is supremely testable these days. Client-side code, what a pain in the ass. I, I, per I personally write quite a bit of Android code, and you know, I, I publish a lot of software I have, and you know, I've never released in recent years a, server, a piece of server-side software without a comprehensive test suite, and I've never written a unit test for Android code in my life. Uh, it's just too hard. And, and that, that's, a, that, that's a big problem. Um, for those of you who think about this stuff, I actually wrote a blog piece a few years ago ooh, um, called Type System Criteria, which talks about the difference between server and client-side software. And 
generally, you know, the server-side software is done quicker and is easier and is more reliable and is more robust and life is generally better. And then I also did, did a whole bunch of stuff um, about dynamic and statically typed languages, but I don't think this is the audience for that. So let's just skip over that. The other thing is, and, and I promise to start, stop geeking out about back-end stuff soon and get to, 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 to client side, um, is that uh, computers stopped getting faster about five years ago, or maybe more than that, five to 10 years ago. Computers stopped getting faster, and instead of being faster, they just have more chips in them. And so if we want our stuff to run fast, and we do want our stuff to run fast, programmers have to write code that runs in parallel. And writing code that runs in parallel is really, really, really hard. And there are very, very few programmers that can do it. Um, fortunately, one of the other very, very good things that's been happening on the server side is the rise of technologies like um, Erlang, a weird Swedish programming language that is hard to understand and, and hard to think about, but was what was driving all the technology at WhatsApp that Facebook just paid an ungodly amount of money for. And so, you know, this is the kind of technology that, that really works in the real world. Um, there's also new things on the back end, and if you are doing a project and your back end programmers come to you and say, I want to use Erlang, or I want to use Clojure, or I want to use Scala, don't say what? That, those are signs that they're probably smart people who, particularly if you have a performance sensitive application, are going to get good performance in a relatively straightforward and tractable way. Um, Since I don't have a room full of backend developers, I'm just going to skip the next two slides. The other good thing about uh, doing backend code is that the backend is where the data lives, obviously. You know, anybody who stores serious data in the client, whether it's a mobile device or a browser, has got rocks in their head. And that's getting so much better. Um, if you care about how the data is stored on the backend, we've finally got out of the grips of the, the SQL relational database. Mind you, if you want to stay in SQL, there's lots of great open source products that don't require writing a check to Larry. Uh, but uh, I just took this one particular slide out uh, about a speech about one of the new databases and what, they, what Netflix does with it. And the amount of performance and reliability and tractability and developer experience we have on the server side is essentially pretty well just wonderful. So once again, we're living in the golden age of server side software. Um, Now, this is the year where at Google, the amount of traffic they're going to get from mobile devices exceeds, for the first time, the amount of traffic that they get from desktop web browsers. That is the future. The, the, everybody's been saying the future is mobile. Well, sorry, the future is now here. Um, I'm just going to skip over all that stuff. Right. OK. Um, of the people in the room, how many are of you writing mobile apps? OK. I saw maybe 40 or 50 hands go up. So that means the people who are paying you are getting about as much work as they could expect from a third that number. And why is that? Because every time you write a client, you now have to write three clients. You have to write the web client, you write, have to write the iOS client, and you have to write the Android client. And guess what? Windows might, be, might, might get traction. And then we'd be in the, in the situation of having to write four clients for everything. Wouldn't that be everything? So that's kind of first, the, the big, first big problem we're having in the world of client-side software. From the point of view of management, it is unreasonably, ridiculously, stupidly expensive to ship client-side software. And it, as a profession, we have to be honest with management and tell them that, well, no, it's not going to get any better. Now, there is um, one way around that. Um, and it's game programmers don't have that. If you look at the top selling games on Android at the moment, and games is where the action really is, uh, probably three quarters of them are written in C++ using old-fashioned game engines. So game programmers really only have to write the code sort of once and then a little bit trimming for each one. But for you, the people who have to write real clients are having to write three or four times for each one. 
So what are you going to do? Well, there are answers. Somebody's going to say, well, that's OK. Let's just, let's just do HTML5. And let's use something like Apache Cordova or PhoneGap or something like that. And we'll just write the app once, and it'll run on everything. And sort of, but not really. How many really terrific, world-changing, ubiquitous apps that have good branding, good UX, good fit and finish have ever been written that way? I don't know. I don't use any on my devices. Oh, there's a hand up over there. Which one? Zero. Oh, OK. <laughs> right. So you know, uh, we have to be a little bit dangerous, because there are a certain number of people in the HTML5 community who have you know, stars in their eyes and really want to convince people, notably including management people, that they can just get out of this mobile apps business and you know, write mobile web apps, and everything will be fine. Well, unfortunately, it won't. Um, so, so we, we got to do this. Um, this worries me. Um, and so let's look about it. Is the trend from the browser, away from the browser towards the app, towards the appification of everything real? And if so, is it a problem? Should we worry about it? And if it's a problem, is there anything we can do about it? Now, I should disclose a bias here. Oops. I, uh, I should disclose a bias here. I'm a web lover. I think the web is you know, the most important computing technology that's happened in my lifetime. And it's, it's made me rich-ish. And it's made me happy a lot. And it's been very good to me. Um, let me tell you a story. because I think it's, people don't realize how much greater the web is than what came before it. People are too young to remember what came before it. So way back in the 90s, I was working for a company called OpenText, which I founded, which still exists. Ooh, anyhow, great website. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, I you know, I, I'm not involved anymore. Um, and uh, we bought this content management company, and we had this sort of integration meeting. And at the integration meeting, there was myself and my CEO. I was the CTO, and their CEO and their CTO. And they had, you know, sort of all the usual stuff for a content management company. You know, they had versioning and check-in and 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 checkout, and uh, search and and all that kind of stuff. Access control, logging, and it was, I think, a Visual Basic app, and it was it was pretty slick. And so we were sitting there looking at it, and this is like 1996, and I said, you, know, you could do all that in a web browser. And the guys in the other company said, well, why would you want to do this in a web browser? <laughs> and uh, we adopted the web browser. And for a few years, we made bucket loads of money, even though we didn't actually have the best content management suite in the world, because we ran through a web browser, as opposed to a weird idiosyncratic Visual Basic or Swing or Windows app. And people, the end users, led the way. They ran yelling and screaming away from the web app, from, from, the in, from, the, from the user interfaces of the world towards the web apps. And the web app totally, absolutely, qualitatively pushed the quality of user experience forward. You know, it had a back button. There was always a back button. Instead of all the different kinds of idiosyncratic menus, there was only one kind of menu. There were, you filled out forms, you clicked on links, you pressed submit, you always had a back button. The world got better. Vendors who, consisted, who persisted in operating, in, in offering you know, uh, compiled native desktop apps were laughed out of the marketplace, because why would you want to do that? People wanted to use web browsers for everything. And, and these days, um, that's under threat. Now, I noticed that as soon as people did that, as soon as the web browser became ubiquitous, there were people saying, well, that's OK, but people really need a more engrossing, enveloping, responsive user interface. And, and I couldn't help but noticing that the people who were saying that were people like the Flash floggers and the Silverlight people and the Java FX tribe who were trying to sell such a thing. And they all fell flat. Flash is gone. Silverlight's a joke. Java FX. Those idiots are still talking about it. So, we all, we, the hu and the whole human population owes a debt to the web for improving the quality of, of the user experience. But, and so the browser reigned supreme until 2010 or so. And these days, mo starting at 2010, the mobile app has really been knocking heavily on everybody's door. A huge proportion of the IT management community really believes they have to ship a mobile app or they're behind the times. They're dead. You've got to have a mobile app. Now, let's be fair. This is causing pushback. 
I mean, I've got almost 15 minutes into this talk without doing, showing you an XKCD cartoon, but, uh, you know. Um, and, and indeed, you know, in many cases, these mobile web apps are, are mobile, native mobile apps are misconceived. And in fact, there's a famous Tumblr whose URL is not safe for work. Um, I'm about to get coarse language on this thing here. Um, it, it's a well-known Tumblr with examples of egregious examples of people who have perfectly decent and useful websites and are trying to push mobile apps down their throats. So, yeah, there is some pushback. And in fact, if you are doing some sort of business function where you're filing an expense report or making an invoice or something, do you really want an idiosyncratic mobile app? Or would you rather just have a good old-fashioned web form you could fill in? And I think most ca in most cases, most times, you know, the web still has a, a broad sphere. The browser-based technologies have a broad sphere where, where, where they are winners. Um, if you care about these issues, there's a guy named Jeff Atwood who um, uh, is responsible for Stack Overflow, among other things, a really smart guy. And he wrote a really, really good, good piece about this called Apocalypse Now, about the trade-offs between the web and mobile apps. But, you know, having said that, the, the trend away from browsers and into mobile is not just a bunch of fashion victim, pointy-haired bosses. There are a lot of cases uh, where, in fact, producing a mobile app is something essential that you have to do. Now, in particular, if you want something that, that is you know, really responsive and enveloping. And one of the reasons for that, and here's where I get people mad, is that um, the programming frameworks for mobile devices, like this one, which is the Android programming framework, it's the Android equivalent of Cocoa Touch, is a much better programming platform than the browser by any metric. If you want to have you know, a scrolling list of things that when you click on them enlarge and show a graphic or fly out or dispatch to something else, there's one way to do that. One well-known class you include and link to, and it all just works. You don't have to worry about libraries and things like that. Um, and you know, I used Android, but, but iOS is just as good. Um, these are really good, well-developed user interface construction frameworks that make developers happy. And they're informed by decades of experience. If you look at the teams of people who built these, these are the people who built things like uh, Amiga and HyperCard and BOS and things like that that are now forgotten but were incredibly influential. I spent a couple of years sitting in the building with the Android team at Google, and that is by far the best engineering team I've ever had the pleasure of working with. So you say, okay, well, you know, the, the, the mobile browser, the uh, mobile native apps are better right now, but you know, HTML5 is going to catch up. You know, don't be so sure. You know, the, the, it's not as though Android and iOS are standing still. They have some of the world's elite engineering teams pushing them forward. But, you know, but every time I go to a web, a web conference, somebody gets up and shows magic with the browser, you know, cross-platform code, native-like experiences, and so on and so on. And, and, and in fact, once you look under the covers, there is indeed a huge amount of interesting new technology sloshing around in, in the browser space. Um, we've got, uh, what do we have here? Oh, HTML5, right, we've got, in HTML5 space, we've got things like jQuery. Now, jQuery has sort of become the, the bottom level of programming in the browser. Nobody, it's sort of like at the assembler level of the browser. Nobody programs at a level, level lower than jQuery anymore. Um, and you've got things like SAS to make your CSS better, and LESS to make your CSS better, and Angular to bring MVC to browser programming, and uh, Ember to bring MVC to browser programming, and Backbone to, well, I'm actually figured out what Backbone does. Um, <laughs> and, you know, ASM.js to, uh, to make your, your code run faster, and Dart, because, you know, H JavaScript's never going to be fast enough, so re let's replace it with something else, and Bootstrap. Boy, are there ever a lot of sites out there with Bootstrap these days. You know, you, you can just see them after you, if you've seen a few of them. And I use it, too. I like it. Um, and then Polymer. You know, you can go all the way and have your known custom native uh, HTML elements. And then Brick, which seems to be sort of a Polymer competitor uh, out of Mozilla. And um, so on. So why isn't the browser winning? There's all this fantastic new stuff coming out, and, and world-breaking technology, world-beating technology, except for I look at it, and it doesn't make me think of any rational engineering process. What it makes me think of is the Cambrian explosion. 
you know, a period in the, in the distant, distant prehistory where evolution went briefly crazy and is preserved on some fossils up in Alberta, Canada, and, and all these wildly variant, strange life forms uh, came, into, came, came into being and only lasted for a very brief period in evolutionary terms. And, and they included things like, you know, this critter, um, which had like, you know, seven eyes and five legs and a horizontal pincer on its proboscis, and so on. And um, evolutionarily, most of this led nowhere. And I kind of worried that's where we are in the world of browser programming. People charging off in all directions at once. And if you sit down to build a state-of-the-art single-page app in your browser, well, you, you know, are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight the Angular versus Ember JS? Wars right there in your group, and, and who's going to win? And suppose you make the wrong choice, and you know one of those projects that dries up, and it's the one you picked. Um, and you know, same same question with all those other things. Oh, and I left CoffeeScript out of there too. There's you know yet another interesting browser technology charging off in an entirely new direction. Um, now, on the other hand, to be fair, some of the evolutionary trends that were set during the Cambrian ex explosion turned out to be major forks in the you know in the, in the uh, in the taxonomy that we see today, and we're contributors to producing things like us, for example. So maybe the good outcome is that in that horrible, murky churn of browser-based technologies, the, the roots of the future just wait to emerge organically out of the competitive fray. Um, let's hope, anyhow. Um, so how do we get there? Um, Someone made a, a, I wrote a blog on this subject, and somebody wrote this really great comment on Reddit, which um, it's probably too small, so I'll read it really fast. Um, you know, he worked on a six month long project with three other developers, two backend developers, mobile developer, and they thought the server side was going to be hard, and it turned out they had all sorts of sorts of tools to make the server side really super easy, and they got that done under schedule. And then on the, on the, on the client side, you know, first needed to learn JavaScript and jQuery, which aren't altogether difficult to learn, but have some really strange quirks, and then CSS slash SAS, which can be really difficult for newcomers. No, no, you can't just do height 100%. Why? Well, yes, it is strange that your div is behind the other div, even though it has a higher Z index. Z index. You need to clear fix that other div to fix all, the way, all those things that are floating over each other. What's a clear fix? Well, it's another well-known accepted hack. And, and, and then backbone and marionette to make make Backbone better and require JS because JavaScript doesn't have a linker. And then, of course, you need to package and minimize this stuff together because otherwise you end up having a megabyte of JavaScript in the page before you can click a button, um, and so on and so forth. So ladies and gentlemen, we're not in a really good place at the moment where it comes to um, browser side development. On top of which, not only are the um, mobile native platforms, you know, sanely engineered and well put together, they come with one canonical IDE, you know, development environment, one canonical debugger, one canonical, you know, trace analyzer, one canonical profiler, and it all just works. You don't have to have a tribal war about which framework you're going to use. You just plug it in, turn it on, and start writing code. So how do we get here? And that's sort of my summary of it. If, oops, that's too. So there's a modern browser at the bottom. And you know, it's based on addressing things with URLs and accessing data with HTTP and using HTML to display text in a formatted way. And then it's got a style sheeting language and a document object model and JavaScript. And some parts of this picture are good, and other parts of this picture are not so good. And essentially, all that stuff I just ran through. They're basically there because they're needed because of the inadequacies of the programming language and the document object model and so on. So am I really standing here saying JavaScript is a bad language? Well, yeah, it is actually. Um, but then, you know, so is PHP and all sorts of wonderful things have been built with PHP. You know, I know you're not programmers, but I, I can't resist one little programming demo. Um, So, you know, here's three numbers, and I'm going to sort them in JavaScript. And, oh, isn't that amusing? <laughs> Gosh. Um, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to really hate JavaScript. Um, <laughs> And in fact, we've got workarounds for it, and we've got layers on top of it, and we've got things like CoffeeScript. But at the end of the day, is this 
the right tool to build the future? I don't think so. And, and you know, CSS was designed in a very ad hoc way starting in 1995 when we didn't actually have any experience with actually laying out real web pages and so on. And you know, there's this famous quote, um, what does it say? Uh, Vertically and horizontally centering a div with CSS is the hardest problem in computer science. <laughs> right? And that's why we all have to use Bootstrap, because otherwise none of us are smart enough to actually center a div. I'm not. Um, so, is the browser doomed? Could be, you know? That actually is a plausible future, as the proportion of time where the device that mediates between humans and the net is a mobile device rather than a desktop, the value of really understanding the browser, of really understanding style issues and HTML issues and CSS issues is going down. And the value of knowing how to build native apps is going up. And that makes me unhappy. It really makes me unhappy. Um, the browser has two super important characteristics that mobile doesn't have, and isn't going to have anytime soon. First, anything that you deliver through the bar browser is unambiguously a citizen of the internet at the top level. Let me tell you something. Here's the right way to use the internet. If you want to do something in the internet, you go into your search window at the top of your browser and you type, how do I do X? and you get a search list, and you click on it, and there's the re resource that lets you do X, and you do X. And that's the right way to use the internet. Alternatively, you could say, oh, download this app to do X, and then you have to go into the App Store and search the App Store, which has crappy second-rate search compared to the internet, and is full of static. You know, they say there's a million things, they say there's a million apps in the App Store, like that's a good thing? It's not a good thing, it's a problem. There, you know, the, the pr proportion of things in, in the App Store that's actually useful and good is, infinitesimal. Um, and then, of course, uh, that's curated. And you know, it's not just what was voted to the top of the results list in Google by people who actually found it good. It's what Apple or Google choose to show you, and minus anything that Apple or Google choose not to show you. And that's a big problem. You don't have to ask anybody's permission to put something on the internet. That's huge. That's, that's world changing. One of the best, smartest things anybody ever said about the web when it first came along is that the web is, a plat is the platform without a vendor. And we've all grown up so, na so, so, so used to that that it feels like we're, we're like fish swimming in water. We don't see it. But it was a thing that throughout human history was profoundly unnatural to have a platform without a vendor. And it's a very precious thing, and, and I don't want us to be losing it. You know, I, I have serious angst issues with both the Android and iOS app stores. Android less so. You know, Google exercises judgment and throws lots of things out of there that they don't like. But on the other hand, anybody can post an, app, an Android app on a website and say, download the app and run it, and anybody can download the app and run it. Can't do that with an Apple device. When Apple says, we're not going to put that app in our store, they're not saying, you can't get it here. They're saying, you can't get it. That sucks. That is not how the internet is supposed to work. So I, I get really upset about that. Um, another problem, more of a technology problem, is latency. From the point of people who develop software, code that is naturally on the web can be updated for all its users essentially instantly. Code that is being delivered through somebody else's app store cannot be. In the case of Android, you have latency measured in hours. In the case of Apple, you have latency measured in the ratio between the number of poorly paid interns, oops, employees they have working on you know, the, uh, the App Store and, and the number of things that came in that week. And you know, the latency can be measured in days and or weeks. And you know, just suppose, hypothetically, that you've got a critical data losing, account compromising, privacy infringing bug. I know that could never have happened to any, anybody in this room, but you know, just suppose hypothetically you did. Well, it sucks to be you if you are you know, living entirely in a mobile store, mobile app store mediated existence. So I'm not going to say here, stand here and say, um, 
apps, the app store is taking over, the mobile native apps are taking over from the browser, and that's OK. I don't think it's OK at all. I think the browser has certain important virtues that, that, that we really, really need to rally around and defend. Um, sometimes you hear people say that, uh, well, it's OK, you know, if what you're building is essentially a publication, then you, don't, you can blow off all this app stuff and just do a browser product. Well, BS, that's just not true. I mean, you know, two of the most heavily used apps on my mobile devices are, you know, The Economist magazine and uh, Feedly, which is, you know, a feed reader. And, you know, my wife, who's a complete news junkie, lives inside the BBC World News app. Um, so, you know, it's not that simple. Just because it's a publication doesn't mean it's not going to get sucked up into the app ecosystem. So what are we going to do about that? I don't know, but it's, it's urgent because, you know, if we do nothing, um, if we do nothing, the Internet's going to be moving in a bad direction. So what could be done? Well, I think, you know, suppose there were a browser that still did HTML but offered a modern style sheet facility, you know, that was designed by people who were informed by the experience of actually d delivering pages and a better object model and a better programming language than JavaScript. If we had that, that would be very, very competitive with the native mobile app ecosystem. And you'd only have to write an app once, as opposed to writing it three times, maybe four in the future. Um, one of the last things I did be before I left Google was to encourage Google that they should start working on that. Um, they're one of the few organizations that could do this. This would be a big, ambitious, boil the ocean project. The only way it could happen would be, there's two ways it could happen. One would be if somebody like Google went out there and just did it, Apple plausibly could do something like that as well. Or the future never comes from the direction you're looking. You know, There could be some open source project cooking away even now um, that would substantially replace the browser with something better. And that would be such a wonderful thing for all of us. Because the lessons that we've learned about UX and design and presentation are not existentially linked to the minutiae of CSS and JavaScript. You know, we could apply everything we've learned in the terms of a better browser. So I, I'm not, this isn't coming from any direction I'm seeing right now, but boy, I, I sure hope it comes from somewhere. Now, before I start finishing about talking about the existential threats to the browser, I'm getting low on time, um, at the end of the day, the web still won, because you know, the web actually means three things. The web has three basic dogmas. One is that anything is interesting as URL, and anything, you know, that's how you access data is through URL and through URL only. That was an invention of the web. The second is that we use you know, short sessions and protocol, RESTful protocols like HTTP to do anything. And the third leg of the web is things like HTML, the markup languages that make it go. Even if we lose the centrality of HTML, you know, the URL is here is the only way to access data, and HTTP is here is the only protocol. So even if the browser were to curl up at the edges and become immensely less relevant, the web would still have won. And I guess, you know, two out of three ain't bad. So I'm going to stop talking about that now, talk about something else for my last five minutes up here. So I think the two things that worry me most about the web are what I just talked about, the declining relevance of the browser, and the second is privacy. And if it isn't painfully obvious that we are in the middle of a privacy crisis, you haven't been looking. Um, you know, and, and expose such deep cultural rifts. You know, talk about Ed Snowden. You know, the, the, the people who think Ed Snowden is a hero and people who think Ed Snowden is a traitor not only don't agree with each other, they can't even find any common language to talk to each other. We have totally incompatible worldviews here. Okay, quick poll. I'm going to ask hero and then traitor. Hero? Traitor? One? So, not surprising in the Pacific Northwest and so on, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue. So I want to talk for a minute about who is actually spying on you. Um, so it turns out that there are a lot of people watching everything you do on the web, and they get a lot of information about it. And they fall into four, ba four baskets. And the first would be the people who want to monetize you, Google, Facebook, and like that. And the second group is our friends here, the National Security Agency, uh, and their allies in, in other countries who are watching you. The third group of people who are watching you are other governments, like other governments of countries with whom we are not friends and who want to impair your work. And you don't have to worry about this unless you're working on something national security related or at Google or, or something like that. And the fourth one is the crooks. Now, 
the foreign governments and the crooks are easy to understand. They should just be resisted, thrown in jail, you know. Take the ship up and nuke the site from orbit is the only way to be sure. Um, but let me, enter, you know, the crooks, we talk about them hypothetically, but I bet you most of you have never actually met a web crook. Well, here they are. Meet buyaccess.com. You notice it's in Russian. They have an English version, but I like the Russian version better. Um, and, and here's where uh, accounts from all these services, stolen accounts, are for sale. And I'm not going to scroll down here too much. Um, but uh, you can, by, by looking at this carefully, you can see which of these organizations have better security than the others because uh, they have higher prices for their account, stolen accounts, and less of them on sale. So the crooks are out there, and we have to be super careful about it. Now, when, when it comes to issues of dealing with the monetizers, the Googles and Facebooks, and the, um, and the spooks, the, the intelligence agencies, these are matters of politics and policy. There's not very much you can do about it with, with technology, except for one thing we can do and we should do. How many people in this room are operating websites right now? Okay, hold your hand up for a sec. How many of you work with HTTPS? How many of you work only with HTTPS? Hey, give, look, look, come on, applause for those people. They are doing it right, okay? There is no excuse for oper operating a website these days that does not operate in HTTPS. You are screwing with your users. You are laying them open to anybody who can do fire sheep in a cafe or subvert a, a router or do anything, and there are crooks and bad people out there. It's not just the governments. In particular, if you are offering a website that deals with people who are vulnerable or young children, and you are not offering HTTPS now, ideally HTTPS only, you should be very, very, very uncomfortable about your ethical and perhaps legal position. Schools. You know, schools all have, you know, dorky, elementary schools, all have these dorky networks with lousy security on their Wi-Fi. All the bad guy has to do is pull up his parking lot in the school, pull up his car in the school parking lot, break out, you know, industrial grade uh, Wi-Fi crackers, and he's got personally identifying information on hundreds of school children. You can stop that. Just turn HTTPS on. It's not that hard. So, so please do that. Okay, now let's talk about the issues of policy just a little bit. And <laughs> the issue, I'll, I'll leave that one for later. Um, the, issue of the, uh, of the, of the issue of the monetizers, the Googles and Facebooks. This has nothing to do with technology. Right now, you're getting lots of free services, and you're not paying for them because they're showing you ads. And to show you ads, they're cap capturing all sorts of personal ident identifying information about you. And if that makes you uncomfortable, it's got nothing to do with technology. Go write some laws. Do some politics. Join a political party. A lot of people in our profession go, oh, politics, that's kind of grimy and gross, and I don't want to be involved with it. I'm sorry. That's what politics is for, for dealing with that kind of policy thing. Is the trade-off between the amount of information they collect and the amount of free service they offer you unbalanced and wrong? Well, the only way you're going to affect that is with legislation and regulation. Now, let's get finally to the spooks, the government agencies who are watching you. Just in case you didn't know, what are some of the things they can do? So they can put bo boxes at the big internet exchanges and run pipes from the routers, capturing as much of the backbone traffic as they want. They can use the FISA legislation to make your ISP, give them all your traffic. They can use the FISA to make your telephone company tell them everywhere you go. They can use the FISA to make your email provider give them all your email. They can use it to make the sites you visit disclose what you do there. They can make, use it to make the sign-in with Google people and the sign-in with Facebook people tell them everywhere you sign into. This is nasty, ugly stuff, I think. But wait a second, wait a second. There's the other argument. These guys, they're just trying to protect you. And there are lots of bad people out there trying to hurt you. And so protecting you is important. They're public servants. They're not in it for the money. And anyhow, if you haven't done anything wrong, why should you be worried about privacy? To which I say, what a load of crap. That is just totally an ass-backwards way to think about it. So these people, the public servants who are spying on you, they're just people. Most of them are sane, honest, prudent, underpaid, dedicated, hardworking public servants. But they're just people. And a small proportion are crooks. 
or crazy or stupid or just plain nasty because that's the way people are. And these people have a huge amount of power to screw up your life. They can arrange that you go to secondary processing every time you arrive at an airport. They can exercise a lot of influence as to whether your research proposals get funded. They can keep you from getting a job that requires a security clearance. They can wreak all sorts of havoc. And, and there's also a systematic problem. Anybody who has had a lot of work with law enforcement has noticed that there's sort of a culture of tribalism that develops in law, law enforcement. The insiders is the outsiders. You know, every time I see one of these pictures of lined up riot troops, I instantly start to sympathize with the other side, whoever they're facing. And I don't think that's an uncommon or an unreasonable reaction. Um, and, you know, we have seen historical instances where law enforcement tribalism has, in fact, led to fascist dictatorship. So, you know, it's not unreasonable to worry about this kind of thing. The other problem is that they, these guys want to put back doors in all our hardware so they can see what's going on. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing as a one-way back door because the bad guys, the real bad guys, the crooks, they know about the back door and they're knocking on it too. And are you sure they're smart enough to design a back door that only they can use? I'm not. The other thing is, the current national security establishment is ridiculously, stupidly out of scale with the danger it is trying to avert. How many people have died of terrorist incidents compared to, oh, I don't know, influenza, or avoidable traffic accidents, or things like that? You know, the amount of money that's being spent and the amount of effort that's going in is just stupid and indefensible. And finally, and most important, privacy is not a means to an end. Privacy is an end in itself. We are fortunate. We live in a civilization. We don't live in a Neolithic village anymore. We don't have to go and carry water from the stinking polluted river. We don't have to go poop in a ditch. We have a door that closes on our house, and when we shut that door, we can really be whoever we want inside, and it's nobody else's business. This is a benefit of civilization. It's taken us a lot of work and a lot of infrastructure to achieve the benefits of privacy. And let's not throw it away over some ill-conceived, wildly non-cost-effective pursuit of terrorists under the bed. So you've got to think about this. If you're building systems, you need a privacy policy. You need a very, very clear story about how you, you respond to law enforcement requests. And if you really care about this, once again, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you that boring, unpleasant advice you have to get engaged in politics. Politics is the only thing that's going to appreciably move the needle on this. The other thing is that you have to get involved in issues of policy, sometimes not through politics, but through litigation. Most civilized countries actually have reasonably, reasonably sane codes about you know, how privacy works. And arguably, the spooks have been skating up to and way over the edge of that. So I expect litigation to improve things some. Anyhow. Things aren't perfect. The browser, that thing we've put so much work into, is existentially imperiled. The privacy of our users is at risk, and we need to take ownership of the problem of fixing it. But hey, we're lucky. We get to build the internet. This is a great profession. You impact people's lives. You make them better. The tools we have are great. They're getting better. The leverage we have to improve people's lives is getting better. I don't think any generation of uh, people in this confluence of engineering and publishing and interaction design has ever had as much of an opportunity to have fun and have a well-paying job and hold it for a long time. So, man, it's great to be us. It's, it's a really great profession to be in. And so we should give something back. I mean, you know, we are, in a large case, large sense, building the future. There are no end of opportunities to change the world in our profession. And you know, if you're not doing that, you have only yourself to blame. So, thank you. <laughs>